Elio, je suis maintenant prêt à commencer. Hein. Tu, tu m'assistes pour le volume. Pour le volume sur... Ok, I'm online. Ok. I'm very sorry for being uh, late. Uh, actually, I had problems with my uh, with my computer. And uh, good morning to all. So I'm going to start uh, the meeting right now. Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues and friends, uh, good morning and good afternoon for those joining us from uh, the Middle East and around the world. And uh, welcome to this event uh, of the UN Committee on the Exercise uh, of the Labor Rights of the Palestinian People. On behalf of the committee, uh, let me express our appreciation for your presence here today. My name is uh, Sheikh Nyan and I am the chair of the committee and permanent representative of Senegal to the UN. Since its creation in 1975, the committee has worked to promote the labor rights of uh, the Palestinian people, including their right to self-determination as provided by international law and enshrined in the UN Charter. Our mandate is uh, regularly renewed by the GA. The committee's activities on the question of Palestine aim at mobilizing efforts uh, to end the Israeli occupation and uh, at achieving the realization of the two-tier solution and sustainable and just peace. As per its mandate, the committee raises awareness internationally on the question of Palestine, including the daily exchanges, uh, the daily challenges faced by the Palestinian population under occupation. And in doing so, we engage with civil society in the OPT, Israel, and elsewhere. Today, we are extremely honored to welcome two renowned panelists, Mr. Zaid Rad Al Hussein, who does not need an introduction and who is alive, a long friend of uh, the United Nations, and currently his International uh, Peace Institute's president and chief executive officer. Previously, he served as the UN's uh, High Commissioner for Human Rights from 2014 to 2018 after a long career as a Jordanian diplomat, including as his country's uh, permanent representative to the UN and ambassador to the, United, to the United States. He served as the president of the Assembly of State Parties to the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court and is a member of the Elders, an independent group of global leaders founded by Nelson Mandela. Mrs. Agnes Calamar is the Secretary General uh, Amnesty International since 2021. Uh, she has been a prominent figure in the human rights world for, for decades. Uh, from six, 2016 to 2021, she served as the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Extrajudicial Summary and Arbitrary Executions. Uh, she was also the Director of Global Freedom of Expression at Columbia University in New York. And she returned to Amnesty International after 20 years, uh, having previously worked as a chef the cabinet for the then Secretary General, my compatriot, uh, Pierre Sané. Our panelists will engage uh, in a conversation on Amnesty International's landmark 2022 report entitled, I quote, Israel's Apartheid Against Palestinians, Cruel System of Domination and Crime Against Humanity, end quote, in which the organization shared its findings and conclusions regarding Israeli policies and practices in the OPT. Our panelists will also discuss the reactions that the report generated, as well as the way forward. So this is the focus of today's discussion. Uh, before we begin, let me share a few words on the ongoing situation in the OPT. Over several years now, the GA, the Security Council, and the Secretary General, as well as our committee, have reaffirmed that ending the continued Israeli occupation and discrimination against Palestinians is essential to stopping the conflict, while stressing the need uh, for accountability for Israel, the occupying power. Forced displacement, demolition, settlement construction and expansion, settler violence and the blockade of Gaza are entrenching the occupation and contributing 
uh, uh, to recurring cycles of violence affecting Palestinians and also Israelis. In its recent release report, the UN Commission of Inquiry on the Occupied Palestinian Territory, including East Jerusalem and Israel, has reached a similar conclusion. Israeli, Palestinian, and other international human rights groups have consistently condemned these illegal actions and practices. Recently, uh, several human rights organizations, including Bethlehem in Israel, Al Mezan and Al Haq in Palestine, among others, as well as Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch, two of the most renowned international human rights organizations, have conducted, have concluded, sorry, uh, that uh, those Israeli practices in the OPT, including East Jerusalem, meet the definition of the crime of apartheid. We are here today to hear a stimulating conversation that will inform us and shed light on this crucial issue. Let us therefore start our panel discussion. I will hand over to our guest and after this exchange, I will open the floor for comments by committee members and observers. As we have limited time, I encourage member states to keep the interventions short and to focus the interventions through questions to the panelists. While participation in this virtual platform is limited to UN member and observer states, as well as the panelists, the general public uh, can watch the event on UN TV, uh, web TV and send their questions uh, via the committee Facebook page, Twitter account, and also the email dpr-meeting at un.org or by WhatsApp using the number plus one six four six four two one zero five. Seven nine. I repeat, plus one six four six four three one zero five seven five. Uh, we encourage uh, participants to tweet using the hashtag Rights for Palestine. So, firstly, I will give the floor to Ambassador Riyad Mansour, Permanent Observer, Permanent observer of the Observer uh, State of Palestine to the United Nations, and uh, I will also revert back to Ambassador to uh, Minister Riyad Mansour at the end of our conversation to give him the floor. But just as an opening to this uh, session, I'm going to give the floor to Minister Mansour. Minister Mansour, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, my good brother, uh, Ambassador uh, Sheikh Niang, for organizing this very important event. And also, I want to thank to you, the Bureau, the committee, and the Division on Palestinian Rights for doing everything in order to make this event uh, uh, available to the large audience that are watching us in all corners of the globe, including in the state of Palestine. And I want also to thank the two distinguished panelists. We are so lucky, we are honored to have them and to listen very closely to their intervention. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Whatever measure you use, whatever instrument you rely on, if you are looking at things objectively, you will reach the conclusion that Israel is committing apartheid. If you use the historical perspective and the comparison with South Africa, you will conclude Israel is responsible for apartheid. It was no coincidence that apartheid South Africa was one of its closest allies. If you refer to the Conve Convention on the Suppression and Punishment of the Crime of Apartheid, Israel is committing the crime of apartheid. If you resort to the Rome Statute, Israel is guilty of committing apartheid. There is a reason why moral and political figures, human rights treaty bodies, UN special rapporteurs, the most renowned Palestinian, Israeli, and international human rights organizations have either concluded or clearly alluded to the fact Israel is responsible for bringing back life a horrific crime humanity thought it had been able to get rid of apartheid. The fact that some states declare publicly 
they do not share this conclusion is not based on any objective assessment, but on political calculations. I might even dare to say ill-advised political calculations that do not stand serious scrutiny. Behind closed doors, a word is often said, confessed, sometimes out loud, sometimes in a whisper, but rarely does anyone challenge what has been so, so evident. The word advocated a two-state solution. Israel chose apartheid on both sides of the Green Line. So now, in the occupied Palestinian territory, who have a military occupation, a colonial regime, and an apartheid reality. Acknowledging that reality is indispensable to address it. Finally, let me say, if Israel was held accountable when it dispossessed our people, it would not have occupied our land. If it was held accountable when it occupied our land, it would not have built settlements. If it was held accountable when it built settlements, it would not have annexed Jerusalem. If it was held accountable when it annexed Jerusalem, it would not have built a wall. If it was held accountable when it built a wall, it would not have imposed a blockade over the Gaza Strip. It would not have bombed, killed, maimed, arbitrarily arrested, oppressed an entire nation for decades. It would not have dared to put in place an apartheid regime operating in broad daylight. It is the only situation where the government passes laws to commit crimes, adopts budgets to commit crimes, designs policies to commit crimes, and then is outraged when it is called a criminal. We are honored to have with us today two of the most prominent figures of the human rights movement, and we will listen to them carefully, discussing the important report issued by Amnesty that deserves to be discussed in every capital and across the world, and to be given the consideration it deserves. And I thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Minister Mansu. Thank you for framing the issue of our event today. Uh, but before starting the conversation, uh, we would like to show you a two-minute video uh, just to introduce the issue. So uh, we're going to watch the video and then we start the conversation. Our conclusions may shock and disturb. And they should. Instead of seeking the truth, Amnesty echoes the same lies shared by terrorist organizations. Five minutes of serious examination would be enough to know that the so-called facts in the report published by Amnesty this week are delusional. Israel may be outraged by the word apartheid. Everyone else should be outraged by the policy. We reject the view that Israel's actions constitute apartheid. We are studying the recent human rights report on Israel and hope to approach cabinet with a further proposed direct action against well-documented apartheid practices of Israel. I hate to use the argument that if Israel wasn't a Jewish state, no one at Amnesty would dare make such a claim against it. But in this case, there's simply no other explanation. Amnesty issue a fact-based, evidence-based, law-based report, anti-Semitism. But it is apartheid. If Israel could challenge the facts or challenge the law, it would not resort to such ruthless smear campaigns. With the eyes of the international community wide open, Israel has imposed on Palestine an apartheid reality in a post-apartheid world. D 
discrimination, inequality, forcible transfers, administrative detention, torture, and so on. Each violation on its own is a travesty, but their true gravity becomes apparent only when taken together. It is then that the depth and extent of this system of oppression is revealed to be what it is. A system of apartheid and crimes against humanity. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, let me now give the floor to uh, Mr. Zaid Rad Al Hussein, uh, who will open the conversation with uh, Mrs. Agnes Kalamar. And I see the opportunity to once again thank very much Mr. Al Hussein and Mrs. Kalamar uh, for being available. And we are looking forward to a great conversation. Uh, Mr. Uh, Zaid uh, Rad Al Hussein, you have the floor, my friend. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Your Excellency. I'm delighted to be back in a committee that I know very well and have served, uh, served or let's say I attended many of the meetings in the, in the past, and uh, even more so to be here with my old, uh, dear old friend, Secretary General Kalamard, one of the bravest uh, human rights defenders uh, I've ever known. Um, I should say as a disclaimer that um, because I'm associated with a number of organizations that I only speak for myself, maybe speak for my immediate family, but I'm not even sure about that, whether my wife and children allow me to speak on their behalf. And so I'm delighted to kick off this conversation with a, a reflection and a, a question to um, Anyas, if I can refer to her in her first name. Um, Agnes, the report released earlier this year, as was mentioned by the chair only moments ago, entitled uh, Israel's Apartheid Against Palestinians, Cruel System of Domination and Crime Against Humanity, uh, which followed a, a similar report by Human Rights Watch. Uh, your report was warmly welcomed by the international human rights movement, uh, the Palestinians themselves, and by many states as being long overdue, uh, but as we heard a recent, uh, just now in a few minutes ago in the, in the clip, it was criticized bitterly, especially in Israel, for singling out Israel, for being unbalanced and giving little consideration to the security angle and its existential fears, and also because it probes into the question of how Israel treats its Arab population, and in particular, how, and I had to put it in quotes, uh, one racial group uh, dominates the other. Uh, it accuses, uh, on the basis of all this, uh, amnesty of being anti-Semitic, or at least fanning uh, anti-Semitism. And I'd like to ask you about all of these questions. As with all reports, it's important to read all of the report first to understand what it is and what it is not. And I'd like to begin with the third issue I just mentioned which I think is the most significant one. Why did uh, Amnesty International decide to cross the green line from east to west? In the UN, the member states are accustomed to dealing with Israeli practices inside the occupied Palestinian territories. Even the title of this session is confined to the OPT which, of course, I'm now ignoring. <laughs> but there again, I've never really been a conformist. Uh, like Human Rights Watch before it, Amnesty decided not just to focus on the OPT, but on Israel too. And I'd like to begin this conversation by asking you why. First and foremost, uh, thank you very much uh, for the invitation. Um, and for giving me the uh, pleasure and the honor to uh, engage with uh, Zeda Lusen, uh, uh, a friend and someone uh, who I think has uh, left uh, a, a very crucial legacy um, to the High Commissioner for Human Rights Office, a legacy that uh, unfortunately has not been followed so well. Um, but uh, Zed, you're deeply missed in your previous position, but uh, warmly 
warmly uh, welcomed in the in the current one. So you are um, asking a, a crucial question with regard to um, to the report. The first answer to um, your question uh, begins with the na nature and the definition of what constitutes apartheid. And uh, I'm, I'm not, I don't, you know, don't want to spend the time uh, going into um, detailed discussion, but we need to remind uh, people that um, apartheid is a system which is formed of laws, policies, practice, and it is a crime which is made up of specific act. Um, the definition of apartheid, there are uh, several of them, but overall, they define apartheid as a crime against humanity committed through inhuman act and perpetrated in the context of an institutionalized regime of systematic oppression and domination by one racial group over another with the intent to maintain that system. The answer to your question is in that definition. It is absurd, practically, legally, empirically, historically to suggest that Israel's segmentation of the territories, Israel's creation of different legal regime is not part of a system of apartheid. It is central to the establishment and the perpetuation of the system of apartheid. And therefore, that particular system, which is um, the green, green Line, 1948, Israel, is part of the entire working of the apartheid system. It is the way um, the system is driven. It is the way the system is um, led and it is the way the system is maintained. So I think that's, you know, that's the first point I want to make, that you go back to the definition and you cannot just uh, segment the territories and then determine which kind of international law applies to the segmentation of a territory when the segmentation itself is part of the way Israel is pursuing its policies of repression and domination. All of those territories controlled by Israel are administered with the purpose of benefiting Jewish Israelis to the detriment of Palestinians. And that is a, a central piece of the definition of, of apartheid. Now, if, um, you know, if we wanted then to focus a bit more on the 1948 Israel, then there too, we found act, which amounts to an act of apartheid and which are necessary to the maintenance and existence of the system of apartheid. Palestinian citizens of Israel comprise about 19% of the population, but they face many forms of institutionalized discrimination. Uh, the, the, the first one I want to, uh, to highlight is um, the, the adoption in 2018 of the basic law, Israel, the nation state of the Jewish people which creates distinction between citizenship, nationality, between different population. It enshrines Israel as a nation state of the Jewish people and constitutionally entrench discriminations against non-Jews, including Palestinian citizens. So that's the first point. 
Um, the second is that the report, and we're not the only one, have documented many patterns of discriminations against uh, Palestinians in Israel. They are denied access to the vast majority of state land, many of which, by the way, has been acquired over the years in what can only be described as racially motivated land seizures. Um, it has long been Israeli government policy to maximize the area of land available to Jewish citizens while preventing Palestinians from establishing, developing their own communities. That too is well documented in the report. What is also well documented and in fact was reinforced recently um, by the adoption of another law is the fact that Palestinians cannot live as a family, that family reunification is denied uh, to Palestinian living uh, in Israel if uh, members of their families, including very close members, live in other territory, demonstrating again how those, you know, segmented territories are part of the same uh, system of, um, of discrimination. Um, Palestinians can indeed vote in national and municipal elections. That we have been told many times, and this has been held up as the reason why uh, there is no apartheid uh, in Israel uh, 1948. But, you know, first of all, uh, very important political elections, political rights are indeed uh, important, but they are not the only element of a rights-based society. They are not the only um, way the non-discrimination uh, can, be, can be enforced. So that's the first thing. The second is that we need to highlight that the fragmentation of the Palestinian people is such that Israel's electoral system overwhelmingly privileged political participation and outcome that support or, or privilege Jewish um, Israelis. Um, the representation of Palestinians in the Knesset is also restricted and under undermined by a, a large number of Israeli laws uh, and policies. Um, you know, finally, I just want to highlight an issue which is very close to my heart because I have uh, been to the, um, to the area. Um, first, I have been to Sheikh Jarrah um, and, um, uh, in, in, in Jerusalem, which has its own way of being, of being run. But the, you know, the, the, the clear attempt by the state to support and to enforce the illegal um, uh, uh, taking over of, um, of housing, of houses, of communities, of, you know, is, is, uh, is part and parcel of what's happening just now as, as we are speaking. I am not mentioning uh, what's happening in, um, in, the, in the Bedouin communities, uh, in the situation in Negev, Nakab region, where, as, you know, since 1948, Israeli authorities have adopted various policies to so-called Judaize that region, including by de designating large areas as a military firing zone, for instance, um, and setting target for increasing the Jewish um, population. There are currently 35 villages home to about uh, 68,000 people, which are currently unrecognized by Israel. I visited some of those villages. Not only are they clearly uh, discriminated against in terms of accessing basic utilities, people live constantly with the fear of their houses being demolished, their land being taken over through the use of violence by you know, by, by individuals supported uh, by the state. I'm only talking here about what's happening basically in the 19, you know, in, in Israel uh, 1948. So there are 
elements act committed there which falls within uh, the definition of um, of inhumane act but in addition i want to insist on that israel 1948 geography is part of the system of apartheid in fact it's its heart it's its head it is a way israel is being uh, is operating that system of oppression and and domination when i um read your report um uh, anas and going to what it is that you just said a little while ago i thought the pages 51 to 60 were of particular interest it, because it forms the sort of heart of the legal understanding of apartheid in the context of international law, as you just explained. And it's argued so precisely. And it was something I felt many critical journalists hadn't really read, or if they read, they didn't really understand it at all. Um, in 1999, I chaired the day-to-day -day negotiations on the elements of crimes uh, of the Rome Statute and thought that your section, this section 51 to 60, was exceptionally good. Um, the section on racial groups, which is the most vulnerable to being misunderstood, I think by invoking the approach taken in the Yelisic case, ICTY versus Yelisic, uh, as to the subjective interpretation of how a racial group is to be interpreted in law, all of this was analyzed brilliantly, um, as was the part on specific intent. Um, and I think, um, having been argued so well, um, it's, it's, it's an issue or these are issues which, if critics look more closely at the material, I think it would dispose of at least some of their concerns and fears. Um, one of the con criticisms of the report, and if I can turn to it now, the chronological narrative uh, following the legal section is, was broken into uh, thematic sections and is long and very detailed and, and very much addresses the history, of, uh, as you presented it a few minutes ago, and the extension into the current period, again broken into thematic uh, sections. Uh, the criticism is that this part was unbalanced, it didn't adequately address um, Israel's security concerns, i.e. the attacks by Palestinian groups on uh, civilian populations, the historical background to the colossal suffering of the Jewish people. And it puts emphasis on this idea of dominating a group to, by considering it f inferior, a charge which uh, carries a lot of um, emotional freight. And not until page 263 uh, does Amnesty International consider the uh, security dimension. My question to you is this, was it a mistake for Amnesty to put the security at the end? Maybe had Amnesty woven the security sort of dimension into the narrative with a few examples, and then assessed the issue of prolongation of measures against proportionality and necessity, two principles which uh, must be abided by in international law, wouldn't it, wouldn't it have been easier then to dispose of some of the criticisms that, that essentially uh, you, you bring it forward? Because for others, I mean, some people may only read 200 pages and not get to the end, and they'll say, well, isn't there a concern on the other side that Amnesty hasn't uh, brought into, into the picture? So is that something that maybe you should have done? Um, the, the first and foremost, I don't have, I actually have, I don't have a copy of the report with me just, just here, just online. And I'm, I'm amazed at uh, the, how uh, well and, and um, in depth uh, your reading of the report is. So thank you uh, very much. Mistake, I, I mean, vis-a-vis -vis what? I think um, putting aside the critique, what will be the source of the mistake or the, the, how could we define it as a mistake? I mean, does that mean that our report is lacking in balance? Does that mean our report is failing to capture uh, something? 
No, I think I think what it is is as as the narrative rolls. Yeah. There were moments in time where the Israeli government yeah. in power could argue that this is not part of a deliberate long-term policy. This was an, an, a reaction to an a, a exigency, to an emergency security measure brought on by attacks yeah. on our civilian population. And what you've done is you've treated this issue at the end of the report. Um, mm -hmm. And I think you, you focus on the prolongation of the measures, the fact that it doesn't fit well with necessity and proportionality, uh, that it's undermined by proportionality and, and necessity. Mm -hmm. And and wouldn't it have been easier to dispose with the idea that that you know Amnesty is not looking at the security as an example of its bias? And that's the only thing that I'm saying. Okay. I mean, definitely Amnesty, as, uh, even if it's at the end of the report, did consider the international and regional context um, and, and the security element. We also, as a matter of principle, and I just want to reiterate that, recognize the right of the Jewish people um, to, uh, to, um, to a state, you know, so that, that there is absolutely no question around those issues as far as this report and amnesty is concerned. I think ultimately, Zed, I'm not sure it would have made a hell of a difference to the way the report has been critiqued uh, or, or received um, if it would have made, made for a better argued report, then that's certainly a critique that is to be uh, considered. However, um, it's absolutely clear that Amnesty was committed to look at security issues, but in no way can those security concerns justify the existence of an apartheid regime. I mean, you know, uh, security was invoked by uh, the white in, in South Africa and the white government in South Africa, you know, relentlessly to justify what and why they were putting in place such a system. Uh, security is always invoked, in fact, by all regimes, the repressive regimes. In fact, I suspect it's even invoked right now by Russia. So, um, you know, security is always uh, invoked by repressive regime and not repressive regime, in fact, to justify their human rights uh, violations. So, um, but that being said, we need to acknowledge those security concerns when they exist. We need to uh, determine what would have been, should have been a proportionate response, in which way was it necessary, whether it went above and beyond what uh, was acceptable under international law. And, um, and we, did, uh, just, we did just that. So, I don't think it would have made a big difference as far as our critique are concerned, Zed, but I take your point. I think I need to go back to it to see whether by weaving in the security concern, uh, we would have given more weight to, um, you know, to that reality, and which is certainly important. But again, I want to reiterate what I've said, you know, uh, whatever the nature and extent of those security concerns, they in no way can justify what we have found today. You know, it's just not possible to use that to justify um, the, you know, the, the, the existence of an apartheid regime it just doesn't flow. No, I, I, I mean, it, 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 of course, whenever a strong report emerges, there's a whole battery of very, um, <laughs> if I can say it, very um, uh, familiar uh, critiques or criticisms that emerge. It's always an attack on the person, the author, the attack on the methodology. And that, I think, the human rights community is quite used to. Um, one of the criticisms I saw uh, and this is also a frequent one, is, uh, well, why does Amnesty International single out with this very powerful report, single out uh, the state of Israel, there are many repressive regimes, as you said, 
that could also qualify for a dedicated report of this size and, and this depth four years in the writing. Uh, how would you answer that question? And maybe I'll answer my own question after you, you do so, please. Okay. Well, I mean, the, the first, um, you know, the, as I have actually said that on a number of occasions, um, this was not the first time Amnesty was applying the apartheid framework because we had done so to Myanmar and to the situation of the Rohingyas uh, two years um, before um, before that that report, so that's the first um, uh, the the first answer. Um, the the second is that when you consider uh, Amnesty's um, uh, Amnesty's work on Israel and you compare it with other countries, whether it is um, uh, Iran, the United States, you know France. Uh, or indeed uh, Russia, then there is no um, there is no way you can conclude that um, um, we are privileging or we are uh, focusing too heavily on on Israel. Uh, we have you know we have actually far more uh, research uh, and pages of work on on countries such as the United States of Iran than we do. Uh, than we do on Israel. We have um, documented, denounced repeatedly uh, the Palestinian authorities' human rights violations and um, um, you know, the, the, the fact that they do violate uh, human rights uh, as well. So there is nothing empirical behind those allegations of disproportionate focus on on israel it's another way of um, displaying the attention and it's another way of focusing on the messenger rather than on the content and the substance of the allegations which must be addressed which ought to be addressed um, and that's still not being done yes i i quite uh, agree with you i um you know, um, used to find that it's amazing that uh, the independent bodies um, within the UN, as well as the major human rights organizations, are accused of selectivity when, when there's hardly a state that hasn't escaped some sort of scrutiny. Uh, it's very difficult to understand where the selectivity argument comes into this. I, I you know, to be honest, I, when I was uh, commenting once on the sit frightful situation in Gaza and the Gaza Strip, and um, I was accused of uh, anti-Semitism. Uh, I, I acknowledged that I could have done more as High Commissioner to focus on anti-Semitism, even if I condemned it roundly at every possibility. But that, there, that does not disqualify also criticism of the policy of any country, whether it's Israel's policy, its impunity when it comes for crimes committed. We have the current uh, frightful and really sad issue of Shirin uh, Abu Agla, yeah. Uh, and uh, and of course there is a sort of sense that any criticism of the policy amounts to to anti-Semitism. And all uh, high commissioners, heads of major international human rights organizations, special rapporteurs, investigators working on Israel, Palestine from all over the world have had to endure it. And I think it, it's a, something that really has to stop this loose application and sometimes wild hurling of the anti-Semitism label at human rights, at the human rights community. Mm. I think and and it, must be, uh, it must be stopped. I mean, the weaponization of, um, of those accusations is very dangerous for the fight itself. Anti-Semitism is real. Anti-Semitism right. kills. You know, yeah. we, we know you know that uh, in the United States. Um, so it is a reality that we need to fight against. And by leveling those stupid accusation at people like you or me who you know fight relentlessly against uh, hatred and against uh, hate speech and and and, uh, and and violence motivated by racism and anti-semitism is really undermining what needs to happen which is we need to confront the evidence not only of anti-semitism of rising 
anti-Semitism in many countries around the world. We need to confront it. We need to develop better strategies, better tools against it. But you cannot do that by leveling those allegations against human rights organization, and you cannot weaponize anti-Semitism uh, in that way. It is making the fight against that real problem uh, far more far more difficult. So within Amnesty International, we are committed to tackling anti-Semitism, uh, both at the International Secretariat and in many sections uh, of Amnesty. This is a priority. We're looking at better tools, better strategy, better naming of it. But the naming of and the denouncing of anti-Semitism does not mean that we're going to silence ourselves on what Israel is doing against Palestinian. It does not mean that we are going to stop our criticism of Israel and any attempt to equal criticism of Israel with anti-Semitism is going to be uh, denounced by us with the foremost, foremost energy because censorship is not an answer to anti-Semitism and it is not an answer to apartheid. Yeah, and and so just before the chair uh, ends our session, <laughs> because we have only two minutes left, um, your uh, recommendations at the end of the report are strong, they're, they're uh, forceful. Mm -hmm. um, given the weakness of the international community that we see, the weakness of states, weakness of international organizations, the remedies proposed to ending the long-standing suffering of the Palestinian people, the subjection of this form of apartheid as it's understood in international law. Mm -hmm. um, what hope do we have to seeing these recommendations realized given the weaknesses in place? And I'm sorry, I've only given you a very little time to answer this, but maybe in the question and answer. Well, we the, the, uh, yes, it is a fundamental question. What we have shown with this report is that there is a crime of humanity being against humanity being committed as part of the system of apartheid. Under international law, that puts the international community under an obligation to take a range of measures, many of which have not been taken, let alone not even considered. What does that mean? First of all, of course, the international community must name and denounce, and that is not being done. Two, um, they need to review, states must review their cooperation agreement with Israel to make sure that they do not contribute to um, maintaining that system of apartheid. They should ban products from Israeli settlement. They should um, suspend all weapons um, transfer to Israel that are contributing, participating to uh, the, the system of, of apartheid. Around the world where it is possible, universal jurisdiction should be put to good use so that those individuals who are contributing, who are uh, uh, crim criminals as part of the system of apartheid must be brought to court internationally through the ICC or through the universal jurisdiction if that is not possible. So there are a number of measures that states not only should take because it's the right thing to do, but should take because they are under an obligation to do so. And that is not, um, that is not happening. Adding insult to injury, there are double standards in, in, um, in effect, which is um, making fights for human rights uh, protection very complex either way and uh, we had a demonstration of this two days ago when the uh, the coi the commission of inquiry uh, delivered its report there was an interactive dialogue and the united states with about 22 states at the time i don't know where they are now and uh, made made a declaration which was really extremely problematic it attacked the coi mandate but it does not attack the mandate of the COI on, on, on Syria, for instance, or on Myanmar, just on, on Israel. It attacked its work. Um, and that is, those double standards are a terrible flaw. Uh, they are really making it extremely difficult to tackle uh, what Israel is doing, which is maintaining a system of apartheid against Palestinians, those double standards are making it difficult to tackle other violations committed around the world, whether it is in Myanmar, by Russia against Ukraine, and so on and so forth. 
So, you know, it, it, is, it is really um, extremely important that we apply international law impartially. You know, I know the rule-based system is under a lot of duress right now, but those countries that seemingly want to protect a rule-based system then need to take the rule to heart and implement them impartially, including when it comes to a friend or to a so-called friend such as Israel. That regime of apartheid must end, and it must end now. Thank you. Thank you, Agnes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Zaid. And uh, I, I bet uh, uh, the participants uh, have, like me, relished uh, a lot uh, this great conversation we have just uh, heard uh, with uh, Zaid uh, asking uh, excellent questions and making challenging uh, questions, uh, asking challenging questions to, to, to Agnes and also making very pertinent observations and, and comments. And with Agnes also delivering very powerful balance, I would say, and very convincing responses. So thank you so very much, uh, Zaid and Agnes. Uh, we are now going to go to the interactive part of our, of our, of our event. And I would like to uh, gather a few comments and questions, first by committee members and observers, and then we'll uh, open up to the audience. So, uh, dear uh, committee members and uh, observers, uh, if you want to take the floor, you will take it. But before that, uh, I will, we will have to show a video from uh, Mrs. Grace Naledi Mandisa Pando, uh, who is the Minister of International Relations and Cooperation of South Africa. So let's watch the video first. Excellencies, distinguished guests, on this, the 46th anniversary of the Soweto Youth Uprising, which occurred in 1976 in Soweto, Johannesburg, I thank the Chair for convening this timely and important conversation on the Palestinian question, and I convey my gratitude to the United Nations Committee on the exercise of the inalienable rights of the Palestinian people for inviting South Africa to deliver this message of solidarity. The events and images the world has witnessed in the past months emerging from the occupied Palestinian territories evoke unpleasant memories of life under apartheid rule in South Africa. Having experienced apartheid in South Africa, the images of Sheikh Jarrah and Silwan, as well as the violent clashes between armed security forces and defenseless protesters are reminiscent of events that took place in Sophia Town and District 6 between 1955 and 1965 in apartheid South Africa. It reminds us of the Sharpeville massacre of 1961 and the Soweto protests of 1976 that I referred to earlier. As South Africans, we find semblance in our past with the Palestinian cause. We defied oppression by a race that deemed itself superior, entrenched through the Nationalist Party's systemic apartheid regime, and witnessed the birth of a free and democratic South Africa. This birth was made possible through the steadfastness of our people fighting for their freedom, as well as the assistance and solidarity of the international community, with the United Nations taking a leading role. This is what we hope will obtain for the Palestinian people. In our new democratic dispensation, 16th of June is a day in which South Africans honor the youth that were ambushed by apartheid police forces in Soweto. I recall the funeral of Shireen Akleh and those scenes of her coffin being abused were so reminiscent of the burials we had to conduct under the oppression of apartheid soldiers under apartheid. On that day of 16th June, we remember the bravery of our young fallen heroes and draw parallels with the Palestinian youth activists advocating for change 
in the occupied Palestinian territories. We are reminded of the young Palestinian women and men who are illegally held in military prisons, denied access to their basic rights and subjected to torture and misconduct, their youth stolen from them, all because they want freedom and a better life, just as we did. Given our painful history and the role of the youth in the liberation struggle of South Africa, we cannot turn a blind eye to the discrimination and injustices Palestinians are subjected to under Israel's illegal occupation of the Palestinian territories. The reports by Israeli non-governmental organizations, followed by those such as the report of Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International, are significant in raising global awareness of the conditions that Palestinians are subjected to. Discussions based on these reports are necessary as they provide credence and support an overwhelming body of factual evidence presented by various reputable human rights organizations, all pointing to the fact that the State of Israel is committing crimes of apartheid and prosecution against Palestinians. Chairperson, the non-governmental organizations have done their part in preparing reports and bringing attention to the situation. The responsibility now rests with us as UN member states to take the necessary action, as was eventually done by the UN with apartheid South Africa. As the international community, we must act on these persisting injustices that are faced by the Palestinian people under the illegal Israeli occupation. We must emphasize Israel's accountability for the suffering and inhumane conditions Palestinians have been subjected to for the past 73 years. Palestinians living in occupied Palestinian territories are denied fundamental freedoms and rights through systemic discrimination and subjugation of an Israel-designed system. These unacceptable practices should not continue under our watch, and we as UN member states have a responsibility to act to end this injustice. As the international community, we must stand firmly against illegal Israel actions against the Palestinian people. The reality remains that, as was the case in South Africa, self-determination and peace cannot prevail without broad-based international condemnation and action to enforce international law. As the international community, we have an obligation to speak up and take action to ensure that Israel is held accountable for her violations of international law international humanitarian and international human rights law, including laws on the prohibition of the acquisition of territory by force. Chairperson, our country, South Africa, remains deeply concerned by the continued contravention of UN Security Council resolutions on the Palestinian matter. The Council's inability to act against Israel, despite their willingness to act against other states, is for us an illustration of the double standards and inconsistency in the work of the Security Council. The question of Palestine remains deadlock and is worsening. We should not allow the absence of accountability to become the norm for our organization. In this regard, as member states, we must use all international legal mechanisms to end Israel's impunity. We believe that the only way to bring lasting peace is to have a comprehensive and unconditional negotiated settlement to end the Israel occupation of Palestinian territories and to find a solution that is premised 
on a just settlement with just laws that are rights-based and which facilitate equality <coughs> and equity for all who have a right to live in the territories of those two states that we wish to welcome, those of Israel and Palestine. I thank you, Chairperson. I thank uh, Minister Pando uh, for taking the time to send us uh, this important message. And I would like to seize uh, this opportunity, opportunity to really thank South Africa for uh, steadfastly uh, promoting and defending the cause of Palestine and for its contribution uh, to the work of the committee. I don't know whether at this point uh, there is any committee member or observer who want to take the floor before I, uh, I, uh, I, I share the questions and the points raised by the audience. Uh, if there is no one uh, from the committee wanting to take the floor, uh, I'm going to uh, share the questions uh, which have, we have, uh, have been collected here uh, for, the, uh, for our panelists. So I see no committee member want to, to take the floor. So I'm going to, to, to share with you uh, some questions. Uh, I, I have four questions uh, from, uh, from the floor, uh, from the audience. And those are not uh, short questions. I'm going to read them. Uh, the first question is from uh, Yosef Haddad, and he is the CEO of the organization called Together Vouch for Each Other. And this is the question. <clears throat> As an Arab Israeli myself, I wanted to know on what grounds does Amnesty International base their reports that Arabs in Israel identify as Palestinians? when the vast majority of Arab Israelis do not in fact identify as Palestinians in every recent poll from a wide range of sources. Did Amnesty speak to the tens of thousands of Arab Israelis, Christians, Muslims, and Druze who serve in the national service or the Israel, Israel Defense Forces, many of whom are even commanders of Jewish soldiers, as I myself was when I served in the IDF? Additionally, given the fact that Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza do not refer to us as Palestinians, rather Arabs of 48 or, or quote unquote inside Arabs or Arab Israelis, where does Amnesty International get the legitimacy to define for myself and my community who are uh, as a people. So this is the first question. I'm going maybe to, 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 to share the second question and then I will stop there before I pass to the uh, next round of questions. So the second question is from John Mitchell. And the question is, to end Israel's unscrupulous control and treatment of Palestinians will depend on the action of the most powerful member of the Security Council, the USA. On numerous occasions, they have invoked their veto in defending Israel from criticism and opposition to Israel's actions. What more can the UN do to convince America to abide by human rights, UN human rights policy and reverse their support for Israel's violation of international law? So before I go to the next round of questions, maybe I'll stop here and give the floor to the panelists if they want to make comments on those questions. You have the floor, any one of you. I, I, I can pick the first question because it's um, really uh, addressed to uh, Amnesty and then uh, maybe Zaid can pick the question about what the UN can, um, can do. Um, so in a nutshell, I think, um, uh, uh, you know, our, our report, which by the way, has taken more than three years uh, to be uh, written and has involved much research and quality control and peer review. Uh, that report uh, aimed to capture the, the, the Israeli government's treatment of all Palestinian communities. Uh, we analyzed quite a lot or almost every relevant piece of legislation, regulation, military orders, governmental directive statement by government and military officials. We conducted research in dozens of the diverse Palestinian uh, communities. And our report does note that the Minister for Foreign Affairs of Israel 
refers to Palestinian citizens of Israel as an all-inclusive term of Arab citizen of Israel. Uh, our research also showed that the authorities clearly consider Palestinian citizens of Israel as a single group, different from the Druze, different from the Circassians, um, since they exempt that particular group alone from military service, <coughs> for instance. So um, the, the State of Israel as a term and within that term makes distinction. So there is something that is singled out as the Palestinian citizen of Israel. We did not in the report uh, make, um, uh, you know, we did not consider that everyone was equally treated and, and equally uh, discriminated against by, uh, by the Israeli um, state. Um, we looked clearly at the notion of racial group to drive our analysis and conclusion. We've uh, said that racial group is a subjective concept, which is dependent on the dominant group's perception <coughs> of the other group. Um, so in a system of apartheid, the perpetrator of the crime treat <coughs> sorry <coughs> a dominated racial group as different and inferior on account <coughs> on account of um, particular physical or cultural attributes. It is a way the dominant groups treat the other that is driving uh, the definition of racial groups. It's a subjective one. Jewish Israelis and Palestinians self-identify as different groups. Crucially, Israeli laws treat Palestinians as an inferior and separate groups, define by their racialized non-Jewish Arab status. And that was made very clear in the 2018 nation state law that distinguished between nationality and citizenship. So we don't speak or no one speak on behalf of the entire Arab population of Israel. What we are saying is that the Palestinians are a specific racial groups who are the victims of an apartheid system. As for um, other members of the Arab groups, they are also discriminated against. There is absolutely no doubt. The apartheid system is directed at the Palestinian. Thank you very much, uh, Agnes, for your elaborate uh, response. Now I give the floor to uh, Zaid. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, the point I think raised by uh, John Mitchell is uh, absolutely <coughs> correct, of course. I mean, it's, uh, you, you cannot uh, dispute it that the uh, prevalence of, of the use of the veto or threat of the use of the veto by the United States in defense of Israeli practices has uh, made it difficult for the UN to mount any serious pressure. Um, but I think the, the situation within the US is changing. We see this across campuses and universities. We see this with uh, the ever-growing numbers of um, uh, the Jewish American groups that are more liberal in their tendencies, uh, feel deep anxiety about the uh, conditions imposed by Israeli government policy on Palestinians writ large. And, um, and I think um, the, the situation is changing in that regard. And it recalls to mind, and I hope my memory is correct, but it recalls to mind a comment made by uh, Shimon Peres once that uh, the occupation will uh, degrade and perhaps sometimes even destroy in part the occupied, but it also destroys the occupier. And I think this is what we have seen. The occupation is a poison that destroys all, or destroys all and it's based on 
uh, a way of thinking that needs to be changed because in the end it's only a cul-de-sac where violence will be obtained which is to the benefit of no one the palestinians must realize their freedoms they must be liberated from their uh, persecution and their suffering and uh, this uh, form of uh, apartheid must come to an end thank you very much zaid for very 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 clear in giving this response i think uh, it's very convincing and now we, let's go now to the last round of uh, comments and questions and after that uh, we will have to uh, try to end this uh, this event so the uh, i have uh, emily schrader from the israeli daily jerusalem post who has made a statement and then uh, and then has asked a question and uh, emily schrader said that the palestinian authority has explicitly has explicit discriminatory laws on its books forbidding a Jewish person from owning property in the West Bank and has a punishment of death for selling land to a Jew. Anti-Semitic incitement and glorific glorification of hate speech is prevalent in every sector of public life, media and social media in Palestine. Recently, EU countries have condemned the Palestinian Authority's curriculum for anti-Semitism and incitement. At the same time, Israel actually prohibits racial discrimination by law in its basic laws and ethnic minorities make up 20% uh, of the population. Since 1948, prior to occupation, the Palestinian leaders have denied the right of the Jewish people to a state and engage in racist discrimination against them. The question is, the question posed by uh, Emily Schroeder is, given this reality, why is Amnesty and the UN disproportionately focused on criticizing Israel rather than providing an impartial analysis that call out any form of racial discrimination and holds the perpetrators accountable. Let me also share the next two questions. Uh, the next one is from Phyllis Benis from Jewish Voice for Peace. Uh, Phyllis Benis uh, has thanked us all for this, the discussion and and he said, uh, the CRPP's follow-up will be very important. And as Ambassador Mansour said, the apartheid reality must be challenged. I would ask the two panelists, using their experience within the human rights agencies of the UN, if they could speak to what else will be needed from the GA or other parts of the UN to bring about the reopening of the Special Committee Against Apartheid understanding that it would not be limited to Israeli apartheid, but would necessarily involve other examples of 21st century apartheid, like the Rohingyas and, and others. And now the last question, and this will be the last question of the session. The last question is from David Wildman, co-chair of NGO Working Group on Israel-Palestine. Okay, he's saying, okay, many thanks for a strong and informative discussion on crimes of apartheid. The question is, how can the UN and international community challenge the ongoing impunity of Israel and the complicity of many companies uh, doing business with Israel? In particular, how might universal jurisdiction be used against corporate leaders as well as Israeli officials in, a, in an effort to stop ongoing crimes of apartheid? So these are the questions, uh, which will be the last questions and comments of our of this event, so I, I give I, I will give the floor back to uh, Agnes and uh, and Zaid, whoever wants to, to speak first. Uh, perhaps I can deal with the the first question. I mean, it, it because the question deals both with the UN and with uh, Amnesty. We we touched upon it um, uh, uh, earlier. Um, when you're a human rights practitioner, whether you work within the independent mechanisms of the UN, so not the Human Rights Council, but the independent mechanisms, uh, the special procedures, special rapporteurs, or my old office, um, or any large uh, human rights organization, the, the key to credibility is moral consistency. And if one looks in at one report in isolation of everything else that an organization does, and as uh, Anya said, um, Amnesty International with 10 million members does a great deal. It covers almost every state, and it has something to say about every state. 
and the same with my old office and the same with the mandates of uh, special rapporteurs uh, because simply put if you're seen to be privileging or overseeing or let's say not seeing or uh, understudying a particular issue that requires study you will be called out on it and if, for the sake of moral consistency I, one can see that um, there is really no singling out from the independent bodies. I won't say that, I wouldn't say that necessarily of the Human Rights Council, because there are some issues which I felt as High Human Rights Commissioner needed to be addressed in the Human Rights Con Council, and I, we couldn't get the member states to agree. But um, I think the, the, uh, an observation of what it is that uh, is, uh, you know, is, a, is uh, accomplished by human rights bodies, it'll point to the fact that, as Anya said, there's comment passed about the, you know, what uh, the Palestinian Authority does in Area C, where it has complete control over prisoners, for example. It will look at uh, uh, issues relating uh, of material interest. I mean, in, in Arab states, in the neighborhood, and Islamic states, well, there's no exception. And so I, I think that um, point can be disposed of, at least from the point of view of the UN. I don't know if uh, Agnes wants to raise that. Just, um, there, was a, there was a question about um, <clears throat> the work on the Palestinian authorities. I think we've already, uh, we've already answered that, or I certainly did. I want to reiterate that Amnesty International has consistently documented violations by the Palestinian authorities. Uh, we have also reported on uh, unlawful attacks by Palestinian armed groups against uh, Israeli uh, civilians. We have um, condemned uh, the firing of indiscriminate rockets uh, from Gaza into Israel, uh, which we called for the International Criminal Court to investigate um, as, uh, as war crimes. We have documented violations against Palestinians by Palestinian authorities, including torture and so on and so forth. So, I mean, the reason why I'm reiterating uh, what we've done and what others have done is that we must, you, we've got to stop um, trying to displace the attention away from what Israel is doing. It is not, it is not how the Israeli uh, Jewish populations should confront what is their government doing in their names. You know, I was very struck when I was in in uh, in Israel and the Palestinian um, uh, territories in January, struck by the fact that as a Jewish uh, Israeli citizen, you can be completely oblivious, if you want, to what your government is doing in your name. There are uh, walls everywhere, physical walls, legal walls, mental walls. Um, but let make no mistake, you can go beyond that wall. You can climb that wall. You may not be able to destroy it, uh, but you certainly can do more than let the walls drive your life or your mindset. And that is scary to see so many people in Israel prepared to live by the walls because those walls are so, um, you know, protective seemingly, but in many ways, in more ways than one, they make them part and parcel of one of the most awful crime, the other awful crime of the 20th century. As the special rapporteur has said, we have a, you know, a, a, a crime of the, in the 21st century, which is, you know, a crime of the 20th century, along with a few other as awful. The Jewish Israeli people of Israel must not choose to live by that crime. <clears throat> yes, the Palestinian people have many, you know, uh, 
must continue to fight for their rights. But I'm telling you, the Jewish Israeli citizen of Israel must stand up for their own humanity as well. And that they are not doing enough. They are living by the walls. So that's the first answer I want to provide to that, um, that person. Um, with regard to the other uh, questions regarding the, you know, what, what, what needs to be done. So the special committee is great. And um, I think um, there are serious conversations taking place right now between South Africa, Namibia, and the state of Palestine to put forward a general assembly resolution on re-establishing the special committee against apartheid, which was initially established in 1962, and to focus on all situations. We support that at Amnesty, we embrace it, and we call on that special committee to be re-established. So I do hope that um, the states that are here today and, and beyond that, uh, that gathering, that they do take this initiative um, uh, very seriously. We need to use all possible tools right now, and that is one of them, to bring pressure <clears throat> so that the systems of oppression and domination in Israel and elsewhere are disestablished. So we certainly support that initiative. Um, and with regard to, um, to the ongoing impunity, I think the, the question already had all of the answers. We need to ensure that the International Criminal Court does move strongly with its, um, with its investigation. Currently, it is engaged in uh, Ukraine, and it is it has started investigating the crimes committed there. I think it um, is, at least on the surface, I was in Ukraine not very long ago, it seems to be doing a great job. It's building also its legitimacy as, as a great impartial actor. Focusing on, on the crimes committed by Russia in Ukraine is great. It now, or will, or should, and must, turn its attention to the crimes committed by Israel. And it must do that with the same commitment uh, and indeed consistency, which is a key word used by Zayd, and I could not agree with it more. Consistency. The world is maybe dying right now at the edge of an abyss because we are not implementing our rules consistently. We pick the one we want, we drop the others, we accuse certain not to abide by them, but we turn a blind eye to our friends when they violate those rules. This is what is precipitating us into that abyss. So yes, they, that's a key word. Please be consistent into those implementation of the law that applies to all governments in the General Assembly, and it applies to the International Criminal Court. Thank you. Uh, Agnes and uh, Zaid, uh, on behalf of the committee, would like to thank you very much for uh, very clearly and honestly and comprehensively uh, addressing the questions and comments made by our audience and for providing very powerful, very powerful points. And uh, we thank you really for, for your time and for your input, and we are looking forward to a continuation of this conversation. Uh, at this point, we'll show a two-minute video uh, featuring uh, the late Archbishop Desmond Tutu, uh, Nobel Peace Laureate, uh, expressing his views on, on, on the issue. Where, which is your house? It's here. Which is your house? My house was there. No, 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 I say still is your house. But it reminds me so much of what used to happen in South Africa, uh, where people were evicted from their homes, and their homes were taken over by whites. Uh, and you would see someone say, you see that house? That used to be my home. You said that what you saw in Israel something that was quite akin to the situation in South Africa, 
before freedom came to the black people of South Africa? Well, in many instances, worse. It's actually quite uh, distressing. Uh, for one thing, there were, we didn't have a war, uh, a war that encroached so very seriously on, on the territory of other people. And having homes uh, demolished, the Israeli politicians are aware that they can get away with almost anything. I have visited the occupied Palestinian territories and have witnessed the humiliation of Palestinians at Israeli military checkpoints. The inhumanity that won't let ambulances reach the injured, farmers tend their land, or children attend school. This treatment is familiar to me and the many black South Africans who were corralled and harassed by the security forces of the apartheid government. It is not with rancor that we criticize the Israeli government, but with hope, hope that a better future can be made for both Israelis and Palestinians. Hope for a future where one people need not rule over another, engendering suffering, humiliation, and retaliation. Hope for a time when there are universal rights for all humans, regardless of ethnicity, religion, gender, national origin. Israel will never get true security and safety through oppressing another people. True peace comes only with justice. Yeah, this is a great uh, video from uh, the late Desmond Tutu. May he rest in peace. <coughs> Sorry. I would like now to ask uh, Minister Mansour, Riyad Mansour, uh, the PR of uh, the Observatory of Palestine, <coughs> uh, to share his final thoughts. Minister, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Brother Chairman. You know, what, what can I say other than expressing our gratitude to this uh, brilliant conversation and to the introduction of a very, very powerful report by Amnesty International telling the truth about the reality that exists, the occupied Palestinian territory and among Palestinians on both sides of the green line. So we are so grateful to having this opportunity to share with the international community content of this very powerful on behalf of the Palestinian people, leadership, their civil society organization, I want to thank all of you for continuing the discussion, the needed discussion, such powerful reports. I promise you that we will do more collaboration with the committee and with everyone who is interested in collaborating with us, tell the truth about the reality of the Palestinian people on behalf of the Israeli apartheid. Also, we are grateful for the Foreign Minister of South Africa for her powerful statement and for the strong uh, message of solidarity with Palestinians. This is another step, this journey, making the international community not only aware of the reality, but also to move in the direction of acting those action speak louder than all the words that we would say. And we hope at the moment seeing action is near because our people are frustrated, our people are angry because our situation lasted for way too long since the Nakba and for almost 50 years since the occupation of the land uh, on the borders. 1967 in East Jerusalem. Brother Chairman, 
Dr. Fabulous, as usual, we thank you, we thank the committee, we thank the division, we thank all those who are responsible for putting together this, you know, exquisite uh, program, including the tapes, including the words of uh, the late Desmond Tutu of hope, and we should not lose hope, because justice will triumph at the end of our apartheid. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Minister Mansour, for your comments and for being an inspiration. Uh, we have now come to the end of this virtual event. I thank you all again for your active participation, and I thank uh, those also who have followed us uh, on, on social media. Uh, I think your accounts have been really enlightening. Uh, today we discussed a very serious issue very serious issue of international law affecting the lives of Palestinian Palestinians that needs further examination and follow-up to ensure respect for human rights, but also accountability. Once again, uh, I thank on behalf of the committee very, very warmly uh, our panelists uh, for this brilliant conversation, very enlightening. And we express also our gratitude to uh, the uh, all those who have taken part to this uh, to this uh, to this event by asking questions and making comments and as per usual practice the secretariat will prepare a summary of these deliberations uh, that will be posted on the committee's uh, website and disseminated uh, via social media uh, the video recording of this event will also be uploaded at the unispal website which is www.un.org/unispal in a few days you can follow the committee on Twitter, join our mailing list to receive the committee newsletter, and to stay up to date with uh, the committee's activities. Once again,